<laughs> oh my gosh. I... What are you doing? I hate, I, I hate, oh gosh, I hate technology. I hate texting. I hate everything. Oh, I, I just... <laughs> I just sent a full-on blast, like chastising someone to the wrong person. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that wasn't for you. Sorry. I was like, oh my god! This <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Wait. I was just trying to give you some tablecloths. I didn't know I was being demonic. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> How icy was the fear when you realized? Because I'm not I even mean, at that level, but I've done that before. Honestly, praise God, because I, I probably shouldn't have. That probably is a good sign. I shouldn't have sent it anyways. Like, mm -hmm. I, I probably that person doesn't need me to nuke them. So I just. And maybe the person mm -hmm. that you sent it to an accident can take it. They're like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean, yeah. It, <laughs> you know i've had i've had quite a few of those recently oh father God. where it's been like oh i'm gonna say this thing i'm gonna send this email i'm gonna do this thing there were a couple of things that happened here and it was like you know i had a real interesting one actually um you know my daughter goes to catholic school mm -hmm. and they were discussing here uh, you know, doing it had been sort of put onto the table, the public health director had put onto the table to to do mandatory uh, woke pokes for the kids mm. for both private and public schools. And the way that it's so, it's so weird here because the the executive has so much power because a lot of the laws are just written in where it's like the director of whatever finance will have all the power to write the regulations like that's what so much of our like so much is not voted on it's just like regulations that are done and so obviously like people were freaking out like the russian community was freaking out all of that and then you know i got the thing from father peter hears and was like okay medical exemption and then i something i got it in me something was like you know what you should write to the bishop uh the catholic bishop mm -hmm. and say my daughter's at the school Here's the thing. If this goes through, we're looking for the medical exemption. Where are you guys standing on this? What's going on? Father, I was trying to send that thing off. I tried mm -hmm. to send it to the assistant, to the bishop, to all these things that was coming back, bouncing, the, e the mailbox is full. All of this, all of this was just going on, going on. Eventually, I was like, okay, I'm not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Then a situation happened with Eric where... They stopped him from going and playing on, in his soccer league at like the, the soccer thing because the company that's running it, which is like a Chinese ethnicity, the holders, Tan, who was like crazy involved in all the Abramoff scandal and all of that. A lot of power. He runs basically like all the sports stuff. It's kind of like his thing. And they were like, no, no vaccine, no come in. So then I sent something off to the public health director, but what was really, and she came back and she was like, and I think I told you, she was like, yeah, I read through what you sent, totally legit, just know, tell any of the Orthodox on the island, like, we see this, you'll have a medical exemption for everything, if this, if this ends up happening, you guys are good, like, this is legit, she was like, but the Catholics aren't, she said, oh. we've got Catholic, we've got Catholics who are trying to do this, but she was like, N but the, but the bishop is like, I mean, he's on a poster down. I was say, he's got, like vaccinated. I was just about to say he's got that billboard. You got a billboard. billboard. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. And there's she was like, she was like, yours is yours is legit, but these Catholics who who are trying to say it, theirs aren't legit. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. So, and here's what's interesting, Father. So it was just like, pray for it. Everything of all the places, and I was like, okay, you go, Saipan. 
they took it into and again not voted on not anything turns out they left it open for public comments most of the public comments were like do not do this mm -hmm. this is terrible mm -hmm. they took it into their little like cabal and they mm -hmm. actually decided no wow it was already there and ready to be signed by the governor and they took it into their little four-person cabal and they were like no we're not going to do it Man, thank god you know yeah i mean thank god man <laughs> you know what i mean let us let us never think that we don't have hope man i mean thank god but i i feel very thankful that i did not get that thing sent on like oh maybe it wasn't the time to put myself on the radar with the catholics not yet mm -hmm. you know especially with my daughter going to that school so yeah well i remember like one of my first um and hi everyone welcome to the royal path we're just gonna stick it right there. I'm your host. I'm I'm your host with the most, Andrew. <laughs> but I remember one time it was my first um, Holy Week. Uh, I think I I had just got I got baptized last or Saturday, but I think it was okay. So it must have been a couple of weeks before that. I was requesting time off of my job at the time for mm. Holy Week because I wanted to do my first Holy Week, all of it. And I remember that they scheduled me for one of the days. And I remember like being filled with this like righteous fury of like, no, this is my religion. I'm going to go on and talk to the boss mm. and like poke him and like in his face, like you cannot make me work this day. I am Orthodox. I am an Orthodox Christian. You mm. can't like, you can't make me. And I remember this is one of the very few times that I know that for like a second, I heard a guardian angel god something i remember hearing like very like quietly just like you'll do nothing you'll do nothing and like i just remember <laughs> it being so firm and so clear mm. and i was like okay and then like literally i went into the office or something like that day and the people were like oh i'm sorry i actually put you on for thursday i didn't realize you requested it off and they like took it off so i was like prepared to just like walk in and raise this huge stink and be like no 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 you cannot make me do this and then just hearing that like you'll do nothing. <laughs> I know. And I was just like, okay, all right, that's fair. And I'm good on me for once, because it must've been so not subtle that for once, like, oh, sure. Yeah. You got it. You got it. And yeah, I probably need to work that job for a little while longer. This subtle, not subtle thing, when things, when the things that, that we would describe previously have described as subtle start becoming not subtle this is a this is a hard thing to talk i mean i've i've had enough background with spiritual practice that i like i get that principle but it's a very difficult thing to to talk to people about especially people in this libertarian to orthodox pipeline there's been a few people that are like they want experience but i think they want like the heavens to open up and like something crazy especially the ones who have had the, like a lot of psychedelic experience or even some psychedelic experience mm -hmm. they're like they want a psychedelic experience but those were never it was never those were never the profound things it was always at most in the like the come the way come down off of it when it wasn't all this that that there was at least in the peaceful period the and that was the whole, peaceful i mean that's period. the whole thing is like writing everything to get to that point exactly you're not the strong wind or the mighty sound that's right it's still a small voice yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's been so unromantic that's the word i would use a lot of the times like orthodox mm -hmm. so far <clears throat> as speaking as a libertarian who i was expecting who had done psychedelics coming into the church i was really expecting hey i mean it's not like there hasn't been some things that have been not on par with like a, the things i was doing but Mm -hmm. Some pretty incredible experiences, but it always makes me feel like um, a little bit like uh, the ramifications of what just happened. But I actually like the creator of the universe answered my prayer. Like my like supplication is pretty like crushing. It's pretty like, oh boy, like, yeah, he loves me. Okay. Yeah, he loves me. I get it. But like, I have never felt so small or weird in my life it's like this landlord that i've been ripping off for years and years and years like cut me like another extension on my rent i'm like mm. cool but like i still feel like a piece of crap a little bit so 
Well, that I'll gets us to where we are in the that gets us to where learned, we are in the creed. Because we've learned not to beat ourselves up. I'm not beating myself up, but I still do just feel a little bit like <clears throat> but really quick before that, because I just gotta ask because yes, I got really please. curious. Are you guys uh cake or pie? Pie. Pie. Ooh. Pie for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. This this is not this is not um it's like easy. It, de- it depends on the pie and Don't it depends on the it, cake. Man. Don't wrestle with it. It's pie. Because what do you it want? Is, it's pie. It's pie. Do you it's want pie. sweet pie? It's you pie. Want savory pie. It's pie. I mean, it's it's pie. Cake is so unfulfilling. Yeah, it's pie. It's pie. Yeah. We're we're it's the easiest one. Let's move on. I'm, <laughs> well, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a cake that is like, but then I'm like, no, it's pie. It's yeah, totally it's pie. pie. Like, because I, I can think of twenty different pies that I like, and I'm having a hard time right now thinking of a cake where I'm like, oh, that cake, that oh, I just have to that cake. I have to have. I can't think of one. Exactly. I can't think of one. But you can think of some pies. Oh, oh yeah. I could go down the list of pies. You just put a pie in front of me. A good cobbler, a good cobbler begins to move into the pie. Is that a pie? It's closer to a pie than a cake. It is closer to a pie. I mean, a cobbler is probably the top. I mean, a cobbler to me is really just a fancy pie. Yeah, it's a pie. It's a fruit pie. If we get get merch ever, I think that should be it. What father just said just now. Not to go back a and cobbler. Listen. A cobbler is a fancy pie. <laughs> a cobbler is nothing but a fancy pie. Father Turbo, two thousand shoemaker. Depending on where we want to go with that. <laughs> cake is so unfulfilling now, isn't it? You take a bite of cake and you're like, that was a whole bunch of air and bread and sugar. But, you know, you know the people who are chocolate. This is how you could tell you're not a chocolate addict because the people who I know who are like chocolate fiends, they would all say cake. They would all say chocolate cake. Every single one of them. Chocolate's okay, I guess. Yeah, I'm not a. I'm not. It's not my thing. Now, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Forgive me. I love chocolate. I love chocolate. Yeah. I like M and M's. I like chocolate. Okay. But here's the thing. I'm still like it's. Do you see how quick I answered that question? <laughs> right. So, so cake is just. There's so many times where I've turned down cake. Yeah, me too. But it's really hard for me to turn down pie. Pie is really hard. So I know I'll we're going to fast, so we should probably move on. Yeah, we should but, probably stop talking about that. Yeah, really quick. One word. What's your guys' favorite pie? Because mine, pumpkin, without a doubt. Oh, peach pie. But then there's also, like, I love me savory pie. I love shepherd's pie. I love no, there's shepherd's not shepherd's pie. cake now, is there? There's no, no shepherd's cake. You ever heard of a peach cake either? Favorite pie. Favorite peach pie. Cake. I mean, pumpkin's up there. Peach there's cake? no peach cake. There's no peach cake, but there's peach pie. There's peach cobbler. There's no peach cake. There's no. I am no almost positive cake. on this phone right here. I could probably Google peach cake right now. And you know what? No, I'm. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you right now. This is as a Southern Californian, boysenberry pie a la mode. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. Well, a cursory Google search has released uh, has shown at least four recipes for peach cake. So I'm just saying, like, yeah, and that's just, but that's I not don't legit. think it'll be. That's good. not. Le- that's not legit. That doesn't sound. That's good. Not legit. Does that sound not, good to you? You know what no. sounds even worse is grape cake, grape cake. But then even then, like grape pie doesn't sound very good either. Is there a such thing as grape pie? Probably. I imagine that there is. I I'm bet not, you. If, I just I bet put you my if you were to Google it this again. I bet you if you were to Google it, there would be grape, grape pie because it seems like anything you can make a jelly. You could probably make a pie yeah. or a yeah. preserve. That is an excellent point right there. Mm-hmm. Anything you can make into a jelly. Yes, that's it. Good. Yeah. We're stopped. That's it. Good okay. zipper <laughs> to the end of that conversation right there. I'm sorry for doing that in the middle of a fast. I don't no, particularly, no. Lord have mercy. I don't particularly struggle with sweets. Like, right. That's not my yeah. job. Watch tomorrow. All of a sudden, know, like, why the- do I want to eat spoonfuls of sugar? What is- and I like, as soon as I said that, I remembered, I don't know if I'm using it correctly, but there's like a bodega at the end of my like strip work. And it's like junk food galore. And it's like mm-hmm. 10 second walk. And I've always Speaks got- Speaks like, to you. Speaks sometimes, to you. Sometimes, sometimes. But my junk food is savory stuff, like chips and like- um, Yeah, that's me too. Like- I don't know, indie cappers, hot fries and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, that's my glutton stuff. So, so okay. bad, so bad for you. So, so for you. I guess 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Hey, guess what? I believe what? in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father, before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made of one essence with the Father by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. Heaven. Yeah. Yes. There's at the end of that. So, yes. Um, that salvation. Is, <clears throat> salvation. What is it? Yeah, it's big. And well, mate, for us men and for our salvation came down. There's so much. This is probably two episodes. Just right. Yeah. Just right there. Because yeah. it's about your it's it goes straight to what you said about the condescension. Mm -hmm. About God condescending mm -hmm. for because we need salvation. And then like. Man, this salvation thing is so. So big, I tell people. You know, it's interesting, guys, I've been telling people for a long time that my what that my wife saved my life and then my daughter coming along even more so. And I, like, I really, really have meant it. My one of the co-stars of my show that I was on, he just pled guilty to murder and got 28 years. Wow. Lord mercy. And and the crazy thing about this is he was like the spiritual, gentle yoga guy of the show i was i was way more wild way more wild than this dude but we were on the same sort of life path and it's just like my wife an orthodox woman mm -hmm. you know and then my children it's like without that break i think my i i think he i think i wouldn't have gotten off that easy mm -hmm. i think i wouldn't have gotten 28 years in a sentence in a, a state penitentiary i think things would have been much worse for me i'm pretty pretty sure about that mm -hmm. and so for me the salvation is really really real and well you know what's yeah. crazy is that 28 years is also for your friend's salvation if he's willing mm. to look at it you know what i mean mm. that, that's what's really crazy is even now god's still trying to save him even after what he's done mm. You know what I mean? So, he, has, he doesn't have the lens to see it yet, you know, but by your prayers, Cyprian, you know, by your prayers, may God continue to like find ways to, to get to his heart, you know? So father, yeah. I just thought of the, I thought of this last week of a way of approaching the, of approaching this, uh, yeah. that might be a good little, good little way in. This might be an Avenue. So I when I first became Orthodox, I read on the Incarnation. Oh, yeah. And um I guess I wanted to ask because there are people who are not Orthodox, hopefully, that are listening. And this is a question that I actually think um I think is like well, um, okay, so I'll just get right to it. Uh, I don't think before I became Orthodox, and even now, sometimes I still struggle to find the words for it, but in the term salvation, like as far as terms of how this uh, like approaches our salvation, how did Christ getting crucified, like help us? Like why, why did he, why did that save us? So you go to any Protestant Christian and you, you ask them, okay, well, how did God becoming crucified, like getting crucified how did that so, like how did that save us how is that salvific for all we know like just god came down from heaven was incarnate and then killed 33 years later how was that important to salvation and i don't know if i have like an ant i feel it i know the significance of the feelings but i don't know if i could name like i don't know if i could answer that question especially before i was orthodox i was like i don't know how that is beneficial to us as a people sure well we could take the short route or we could take the scenic route which one would you like i would like the scenic scenic okay well the first thing is are we who's our audience not like in the question like who who who's the audience because it because it depends right because on the one hand um There is this um, 
there's benefit in a, in really kind of pulling apart and exposing the the Western errors. And so for a lot of people, by doing that, that can really kind of open their heart, open their mind to, you know, the story of Christ, to the life of the church, uh, the history of the church, in a way that can actually kind of like get them to take some steps forward, right? But for another person, um, that wouldn't be so beneficial. And so we have to be careful who we're talking with, because sometimes us as Orthodox, we can um, reduce something down too simplistic and we can put too much of an emphasis on the, on the Western errors when in fact, you know, it's the problem with how the West understands it. Um, there is definite erroneous theology there, but the problem is really there's too much of an emphasis, right, uh, in some regard. So that's another way to approach it. And then there's another way to approach it, which is you know, really getting into a very kind of like lived out practical aspect. So we can do all three and I kind of look at it like. Um, we'll end up on the third for sure. We always yeah, end up on the, the third. The yeah. third is the, the, that's the one I could probably be most interested in. Okay. Well, well, no, active, I, active I would even explain that one probably the most. Be like, well, I know why Christ was crucified, except blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Okay, well. You, you know, take whatever, you wait, you go whatever way you want. Well, I look at it, just let, let's look at it in the context of combat, right? Uh, different techniques will, uh, will get you different results, right? So let's go with like some G Kundo. Let's just do like the, the least amount of moves possible right, to get the job done, right? So the least amount of moves in this kind of context that you're asking, I would say is um, Christ died, not necessarily, you know, in our place, but to show us the way, right? If that makes sense. So Christ's death primarily begins to undo the power of death, right? because it's by his dying, his resurrection was made possible. And that is the undoing of death, right? And so when you begin to approach that aspect of it, of just the undoing of death, what you're left with is simply saying to someone, you know, Christ shows us what it means to be human and God, right? Through his death. And by embracing and, and following him in his death, we become not only you know, truly human, but we eventually become truly, you know, like God, right? And then you begin to unpack all of what that means to be like God, right? Lowercase g, you mm -hmm. know? Like we being the lowercase, him being the capital G, right? But when you say the power of the power of death, Father, are you talking about the the human fear of death? What are what are we talking about when we talk about the power of death? Yeah, so so the power of death is yes absolutely the fear of death um, on the psychological level and that psychological level is primarily one of the ways in which you know the fallen demonic forces feed off of mankind and basically use mankind you know fear is kind of like the chariot that the demons ride in on for a lot of people um so on that on that level yes but there's another level with which is like ontology like being like literally the power of death prior prior to let's just say hypothetically right let's say hypothetically christ didn't come yet right because when saint paul talks about christ coming he uses the word kairos versus chronos chronos is like clock time kairos is like window of opportunity so christ coming we we trust and we we can assume that that was the perfect time to affect reality, forwards and backwards, right? Mm -hmm. But in theory, just for the sake of argument, Christ could have came, like not have chosen not to come when he did. And let's say he, he, he came in 2000, you know, 19, 1980, <laughs> let's just say whatever, right? So basically everyone, everyone who up until the time of his coming, right? Or he, let me back up. Let's say he hasn't come yet, 
let's say he has, let's say we're still waiting the Messiah, right? Well, if we're still waiting the Messiah, then everything that we experience as Orthodox Christians wouldn't be possible. They're like, there would be no church. And understand what I mean here. <clears throat> this is a great, this is a great point actually that just kind of came to me because this under this kind of undermines and exposes the fact that some people simply see the church as a historical institution by which people get together based around some sort of like common, common like, you know, fellowship, camaraderie, like an Elks club or like, you know what I mean? Like the Scottish club or something. It's interchangeable with any of these other things. Correct, correct. Well, the reality of it is, is like for those of us who are in the church who are participating in the life of the church, we know that's absolutely not the case. We're experiencing someone and something that is absolutely life-changing and not simply life-changing like a good TED talk, but like life-changing, like we're experiencing it like in our bodies ontologically, right? We're experiencing transformation in our minds and our hearts. So that reality is only possible because of the resurrection of Christ. So when we talk about experiencing the resurrection, what I hope this exposes for everyone is like, we're not talking about some kind of like, well, this is an analogy or this is kind of, no, no, I'm saying literally, mm -hmm. you need to be experiencing the resurrectional power of Christ. Like fathers are clear about this. St. Ignatius Brunacino talks about this. St. Simeon the New Theologian talks about this. Like you need to be experiencing the power of God in your life now. If you're not, something's wrong. He's very clear about that, right? So the problem becomes, well, what does that look like? And so many people, I think, in the church actually are, or perhaps might be experiencing that resurrectional power, which is only possible through the crucifixion, but they just don't know what they're looking for, right? It's kind of like getting back to like, we were talking about people wanting the kind of sensational experience, mm -hmm. like, a, like something parallel to psychedelics, like you need to kind of know what you're looking for, right? Because oftentimes you'll miss it, but this, this resurrectional power is only possible through the crucifixion of Christ, literally because of what he did, undid its hold on us, right? We are no longer bound in the same way to certain behaviors and processes that produce death in us. For instance, right? Without Christ, you are a slave and absolutely subject to your sins. So Mr. Porn Addict, right? you can't help but go down to the local porn shop, right? And every time you go down to the local porn shop and you give them their money, their doors stay open. And every week and every month and every year that their doors stay open, there's more prostitution, there's more drugs, there's more sexual abuse. There's, you see what I'm saying? All that is, is directly related and, and, and correlated to, to that sin that is manifested, that that source of infection, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, you're powerless and you just continue to, to not only feed off of it, but it feeds off of you, right? But through the death of Christ, you're able to now on multiple levels, right? On the psychological level, on the, the emotional level, and, and on the spiritual level, you're able to start unchaining yourself from that power, right? To the point to where first you say like, hey, I need to pick up my cross and die to myself. Okay, that's, that's, that's about as far as Jordan Peterson, let's say, would go with us, right? Or where he was at, I don't know about now, but back in the day, right? So that gets somebody somewhere, but that's not enough because then you have to move deeper to a heart level, to an to emotional level, and you begin to understand the ramifications of, of everyone around you and the way that this plays out, right? And you begin to understand that like this connection in the, in, in the bad way is really contingent upon your participation. You begin to see like, man, that, that woman I'm watching, that's somebody's daughter. And like, you, you see what I'm saying? You begin to understand that on a broader level, but then that takes you down to an even deeper level when you begin to understand, my God, there are forces behind this. There is, there, this is, this isn't just kind of like half, this is, this isn't just simply man having a, an urge like a dog who needs to like take care of that urge. This is far deeper than that. And then you begin to say, well, how can, how can I be saved? What, like, what, like, 
how can any of this be changed, right? So all those chains begin to be broken only in the life of Christ, only in the church, right? That's direct evidence of that resurrectional power, which is only possible through the crucifixion, right? Because the crucifixion, the fathers talk about the crucifixion in this way. Um, well, specifically the death of Christ, they, they, they'll speak about Christ being swallowed up by death, but death not knowing who, like who had just swallowed. And so death not being able to contain him is like, forgive me for saying this, but he's like the first, you know, kind of suicide bomber. It's just like, he takes him in and it's just like, boom, he blows open hell and death, right? With his, because he's life, he is life and he cannot be contained, right? And so this is where you start getting a glimpse into certain things like, it isn't, ex it isn't exhaustively this, but like when the Lord says, don't say anything to these people about what I just did. It's not my time yet. Don't say anything about this, right? Because there's a whole process of him needing to allow certain things to come forward. There's a whole process in which he's, let's say, flying under the radar until the time, right? Because the devil was lurking and searching for him, right? Through hair and all these things. And so it's just like, like everything is about this perfect timing. Everything is about this perfect timing. Does that, do you see what I'm saying? So, 100%. So yeah. he was like, hey guys, keep it chill because like I need to not, death needs to not know what it's taking on mm -hmm. when I die. Mm -hmm. So, okay, then really quick, I'm so sorry. Let me just say this one last thing too, real quick because people yes. went, yes. seriously, like, that, because because when you understand he's like, there's there's a portion in Mark when it talks about he couldn't go into certain towns anymore because word was spreading around, right? It says that in Mark. So he's like, you know, he, it, it kept him when, when his, when fame about him got to certain places, he couldn't go there. It kept him from, from entering in there. So in that same way, when you begin to understand that the Lord was cognizant, obviously, about the nature of his mission, right? Anyways, what were you going to say? <coughs> um, okay, so... So I guess if I guess I always assumed he was talking about the Pharisees when he was talking about the like, keep it chill, because I don't want because I, I knew that that was a theme that he was kind of trying to keep it on the low. So I guess I always thought that he was talking about like the. Well, who did he call a brood of vipers? Oh, wait. Uh, I don't know. We lost Cyprian, but. um yeah. So anyway, we'll just keep going, I guess, for a little bit. I think the guys working on our internet lines just blew themselves up. So Cyprian just, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Lord have mercy. Oh boy. Okay. Well, I guess we'll just keep plugging through for a little bit. Um, maybe he'll come back, but that's what you get. I mean, this is kind of the equivalent of live TV. So oh. that's, that's what you get. Um, well, maybe we, we must be on something good because I know that's my first thought was like, man, okay, okay. all right, we must be on something really good right now, yeah, okay. Um, well, luckily, we've got chemistry, so we can keep this going. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> well, that's troubling. I was like, giant explosion is what Vin Armani says. Oh, Lord, have mercy. There, um, I'm gonna, I'm so sorry, people that listen to us, one second uh lol is everyone okay um okay so um so then i don't want again because there's this whole idea that maybe sometimes maybe sometimes we sometimes as orthodox talk about things we shouldn't talk about so um because there's some deep secrets maybe out of not like secrets, but like knowledge that maybe people aren't ready for sometimes. So I don't want to get into a whole tangent here. It talks so in um, the church death is talked about so very much as an entity. So at least the, some of the language I picked up on. So is there like a, in a like in Marvel, like a lady? No, 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 no. Death is not an entity like, not a like, deity, but like a yeah, like a fork. death is not an entity. Like like the demons are non-entity. You know what I mean? It's not the same. 
Okay. Like you, you'll you'll see um, you'll see some you know kind of like the uh, theological poetry where they'll give a kind of personification to death. Okay. But but, but no, death is not an entity like uh, like the demons are non-entity. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, so no, so that's not like chilling out on a giant rock in space with Thanos or something like that. No, no, no. no. Okay. Okay. All right. So then with that, there's that poetic language there. So then Christ then becomes swallowed by death, allows his like, cause he is life allow Like, so then that's that angle to that answer. Mm -hmm. But if we were see, to the problem with that is though, like, I just, this sounds odd. I don't know how effective, not, not that it needs to be like, we're not selling something, but I just don't know if that's, it's there. I think it's, I think that's more helpful for someone who's already in the church. Sure. Than it is someone outside of the church. Sure. You know I mean? Because I, that aspect of Christ, you know, the, the swallowing up. Um, because to the ancient mind, I think it, it had a kind of greater play and ramification than maybe to us now. You know what I mean? Okay. I think, I think that's one of the reasons why Perhaps, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. I don't know if it's the Western understanding of it has shaped our ability to kind of perceive and, and, and understand it or, or our kind of ability to perceive and understand the death of Christ necessitated a more kind of graphic, um, juridical, um, almost like transaction in it like a, like a transit transactionatory um perspective of it because that that's the thing with the west it's very much like transaction being paid you know what i mean it's like well jesus you know kind of paid the price all this stuff which yeah see that's that's confusing to me that's confusing to me because i've heard that yeah well well the eastern fathers i'm sure there's some western fathers too but really the eastern fathers are like you know, they'll say like, well, who did he pay the ransom to? Not the devil. Like, you know what I mean? He he sure. he, he wouldn't have done that. They, so they'll they'll take they will take strong issue um, with that that type of language. Um, but the problem though is there can again be too much of an overcorrection. And so um, I know a nun who actually did who actually did her thesis on this in regards of um, finding um, substitutionary language in the Eastern Fathers. So in other words, there are, there are Orthodox Fathers who will use that language as well. The, so the real problem is that it's a, like an exclusive, exclusive emphasis on that, right? So okay. that, that's like the only way to understand it. It's like, Jesus died for you because like he needed to pay this ransom. Um, Jesus died for you because God was mad and he had to, you know, only way he could be appeased was the father was mad. Only way he could be appeased was by sending his son, you know. Um, that language is problematic primarily because it's a very heavy improper emphasis, right? Um, and so therefore it, it distorts the, the reality of, of the crucifixion. Um, and what what happens there right but the crucifixion and the death of christ for us orthodox it really becomes the means by which we enter into the life of christ yes because that beginning of entering into the life of christ and what we mean by that is his death not just how he dies but the way in which he dies right and why he dies becomes this beacon uh, and this guiding light for us to, to filter our own life experiences, right? Our own existence in this life. That's one level of it. Another level of it is that, again, like I said earlier, his death is the means by which resurrection, um, it's like his death is the key to which the door to, to resurrectional life is, is opened, right? So for us, yeah. we begin to experience that through the sacraments and through the life of the church and through 
all the, the graces in which the church gives us. That's another way to understand it. But another way to also understand this is that we, we begin to participate in the life of Christ in, in many ways. This is going to sound really weird for people, but in many ways by um, bowing our knee to him as, as, as our king and our champion if that makes sense. Like he's the champion in which we've found, like he, he's the one who's gone to battle for, for our, for our race, for our people, you know, and um, through that heroic, ultimate heroic act, we are able to pledge our devotion, our fidelity to him, right? And so we become um, citizens of this, this, of this kingdom that he has, right? Um, because we recognize his power, right? We recognize that um, how many men like Alexander the Great and like, you know, all the great heroes of old came in and conquered through the strength of their arm and the, the sharpness of their steel. Hmm. Christ comes in and, and does the impossible. He, he undoes the world and all the demonic powers through, through losing, through death. Wow. So, yeah. When he was incarnate, um, I had heard a while ago that not even like the angels knew that that's what was going to happen. Like, yeah, like it, it was all, they were peering into everything just super, I mean, even still probably more amazed than we are, right? Because they, they behold and understand the true glory in which, he, in which he condescended from. For us, we don't understand that. That's why when you see certain, that's why certain saints like Sophroni and his spiritual father, Silouan, you know, or uh, like St. Simeon, they have this radical, you know, to the world, extreme humility about them. And they have this um, radical devotion to carrying out the commandments of Christ. Number one, because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, because they've seen a measure of his glory, they're willing to do anything and they recognize there, there's nothing that can be done that can outweigh that experience. Yeah. When, when St. Euphemia visited St. Paisios, he asked her about like, how was she able to endure all the torture she went through? She's like, if I had known what I was about to, what I was going to experience in heaven, I would have done it a thousand times over. I've heard that. I've heard that, that even the worst things that have happened to us here will be like mm -hmm. thankful. We'll be thankful that I was actually just writing a paper paper about that earlier. I'm finishing up one of my classes for school and it was asking me, oh, like, what are your, uh, what are some like parts of your story that are going to be like redemptive eventually? And I was like, oh, lady, you have no idea what you're asking. Like, I'm orthodox. Like, I could talk, I could write like a six page paper about this right now. And that was one of them was I, I spent this paragraph talking about, I was like, look, at the end of the day, I don't, well, that was really, really important for me when I first came into the church was um, recognizing that the bad things that had happened and objectively there were bad things that happened to all of us. Like these are not good things, but that it wasn't like random. It wasn't chaos in the void, which I at some point subconsciously had been thinking up until I kind of got a little bit of healing of being like, oh, wait, no, these are all things that have helped craft me. These are all things that are like helping to shape who I am and carving out like my icon, like starting to kind of like paint who I am as a person. These are all things that have really affected me. And so I was like, at the end of the day, like that beginning of that healing then led to this idea of, okay, well, if this is happening to me for a reason then it's a very important reason. And then this burden that I'm carrying right now will become transformational at some point. And it will be either on this in this life or the next life or this life and will continue on through the next life and blah, blah, blah. But the point being that like that whole um, aspect of the cross was one of the very first things that like appealed to me about like, you know, the whole thing mm -hmm. was like, oh, wait, I don't have to like, like I've said before to you, Father, maybe, but I 
it's like an AA and in the Orthodox Church to a much better degree, the Orthodox Church, but it's like Orthodox Church ellipses and then below it is like where your like loneliness anger and depression like aren't meaningless anymore mm -hmm. like it actually counts for something now there's actually like a relevance to it there's actually like a weight and a merit to it mm -hmm. all that is to say is i think i got what you're saying i think i got what you're saying yeah yeah hopefully hopefully we'll see yeah time will tell so that that whole experience of um seeing all those levels to that question i think is you know i'm glad you brought it up because it's um it's one of the great things about the church in regards of you can get it you can get as simple of an answer as you want which is it that's great or you can just see that the nuance and the, the layers are you know myriad. yeah there's a myriad of them so mm -hmm. okay so that is all in all that part of it. So then we talk a lot about salvation, but again, and maybe this is on purpose because I've tried to understand like what salvation is. And I think like it's kind of been purposefully left vague because like, I don't know what this process, I know there's a purification, but like, I guess, if, if somebody's going to die and then become saved in heaven, which is from what I understand that they've never been Orthodox or anything. And then like an Orthodox, like, what is that salvation? Like, what does that mean? What is like, what takes place? I know that like, it's kind of purposefully left vague, but uh, I wasn't sure. Well, I think the thing is, is we got to understand one of the things that helps us kind of unpack this and understand is we take it out of the hyper individualistic, kind of like lens of like me being saved, me kind of like making it because of, of something. That aspect's there, don't get me wrong, it's there because every man is gonna be judged by his, by his deeds. But I think it's important to understand it in, in, the, in the kind of broader sense, first and foremost of just mankind. Sure. And what we are because we, um, we are the, we are the, um, the meaning, we are, we are the embodiment of, of, of meaning and, and experience, right? Like the invisible and the invisible, that's what we are, that's what we represent, right? Um, and so we begin to understand that man is this, man's created to be this living symbol of reality, right? That's, that's one of the ways to understand God's purpose in, in creating us. Then you begin to understand that when we say salvation, salvation is really about the, the, the saving of something, right? You can't save something that is, that is inherently and has always been bad. There's nothing to save, mm -hmm. right? You can only salvage or save something that uh, at its core was good or has some good aspect to it and therefore you know has been corrupted or something's fallen, gone missing whatever but that when we say save that's the first thing is to understand is that we're talking about the value the goodness of of how god has created us and what we are and when you begin to tackle that first then all the other things about being quote unquote saved like well, where is heaven and what are we going to do? All those questions become a little bit more easier to discern and to understand, but you have to get that, those understandings of what we are and, and, and what, our, what God's intention was behind creating us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like a restoration? It's, yeah. That's a, it's a much better way to approach it than, because that's one of the things about this idea that, um, again, out of the West, of man being inherently sinful, inherently evil, um, inherently, you know, worthless, basically. That's, you can't save something that's inherently unsavable. Like there's nothing, there's no redemptive quality to it, right? So like, it's like taking something precious and making it precious again, rather than like- Right, right. you can't redeem mind. something that's irredeemable. Yes. Right, you can't redeem something that has been 
that, that has never been work of, of any value in the first place. How, how can you do that, you know? Does that make sense? So that language even shows us something and, and it shows us and it points to us the life that, that um, we're to experience, which is kind of what I was saying or alluding to earlier with St. Simeon and, and others when they talk about experiencing the, the resurrectional power of Christ like now, because when you begin to understand like that is, you know, part and parcel of the life of Christ that we can experience, yes, but it is also part and parcel of our, you know, our destination, what we're, what we're intended, not simply to go, but, but to be. That's what we're meant to be is, you know, gods, you know, little g. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, you understand that and you understand that high calling and that, I mean, the giftings that God has, has bestowed upon man, but the giftings that he wishes to bestow upon us, they wishes to lavish on us, which again, in the church, we begin to taste these things. We begin to taste, it's instead of the kind of like elusive mythical understanding of, of honor and, and, and wisdom and all these things that the ancients talked about, you actually, you know, you in Missouri can actually begin to taste that, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. incredible. Yeah. Right? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry about the dead air. You know, there's just like, it's always really nice because when one of the things I like about orthodoxy in particular, by extension, of course, God, is is that once you start really unraveling things, stuff just starts to click. It just starts to click. And like, um, I was just talking with someone the other day about the differences between Eastern and Western perceptions of hell. And when I got done, he was like, it makes, I was like, sense. It makes much more sense doesn't it but actually you touched on something just a second ago i kind of want to revisit really quick um you talked about like so where is that coming from where is this coming from this the western notion of like is it ultra rationality that has led us to this view of mankind being like inherently sinful just like just like worthless worthless is the word that you use where is that coming from because like that was something else i was talking to this person i was like i don't know where this view of hell came from exactly but like it seems counterproductive so like is that like i've heard from people before that's kind of like a little bit of paganism getting mixed up into christianity and stuff i don't know about that i mean i know someone might i mean i I honestly couldn't answer that right now um, with anything authoritatively because everything at this point I would just kind of be speculating at because I know people talk about Zoroastrianism and its influence there. I know that on a real low level, I would, you know, I would talk about John Calvin and I would talk about the, the, the reformers and their beginning to really bring about this emphasis. But the reason why I don't want to do that is because I'm not so sure that it it didn't find its roots earlier on in that, or earlier on, let's say in the Roman Catholic Church somewhere with someone taking a portion or part of maybe of what someone had begun to teach at that time and just kind of like ran with it. So this one, was, this is kind of like a tougher one in regards to the history of where it comes from, um, but it definitely has its, spiritual roots from my perspective um, in regards of the way that it's been able to take a hold of people rooted in the the kind of rationalism and the enlightenment for sure you know because i think that Hmm. i think that there is something to be said for like for me the sound this sounds kind of weird but for me the transhumanism that we're seeing take shape now Mm -hmm. finds its embryo in this time right you get to this place where man people start saying man can't be the measure of things man can't be you know the crown of, of creation man can't be like whatever it is and that thought really 
the, the road to that thought comes from the disregarding of the heart, the noose, the soul, and, and, and moving exclusively into the intellect. Mm -hmm. right? And when you, when you look around, let's say, and you see the ravages of the dark ages and all these things, and you, know, um, you have centers of power that want to um, maintain that power through, through various means, particularly through you know, religious teachings and things like that. It's like, it, it begins to make sense that this undermining of, of what man is, is one of the great ways to begin to undermine who God is, who God's character is. Right? Okay, okay. You see, you see where I'm going with that? Yes. And, then, and then from there, you know, the logical conclusion is, is like, well, if you can undermine who God is and, his who is, and who he is by his character, then it's very easy to say he's dead. And if he's dead, then what's left? And what's left is we are left. And what is the best part of us, which is, you know, our mind and these things, the, rep the reptilian part of us, if you will, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so we begin to feed that aspect of us in, in culture and all these ways. And, and we feed it by deadening the other aspects. You know, we, we feed that, that, as that negative aspect of us by pursuing truth at the detriment of beauty. Yes. We, yes. we begin, you know, which is really not truth, but correctness, you know yes. what I'm saying? Utilitarian um, eff efficiency, right? People think truth is, you. people mistake quote unquote utilitarian, quote unquote truth for utilitarian efficiency. That's how I, that's how I would call that. And so that, really, really quick. Could you expand on that? Just really quick. Like yeah, maybe truth is a person, truth is a person. And so truth, when you, once you, once you have found truth, person who's found truth doesn't need to to fight for it <laughs> yes yeah right? it's, it's the people who don't know truth are the ones who fight for it um i'm not seeing isaac the syrian it's just very true you know um is that a quote by saint isaac the syrian huh is that a quote by saint isaac it is, the syrian? It, is it is it is it's kind of like in some ways um you know i i I mean, you know, it's whatever we, we live where we live, but like, you know, it seems like every month or so, every three weeks or so, like my wife is, you know, getting harassed by some, some joker, right? Um, and so bar my wife feeling uncomfortable by some guy, you know, saying, hey, like, getting, like hollered at? Yeah, hollered at. Okay. Can, you know okay. I mean? like, hey, you know, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like hook up or whatever. Um, but you know, beyond the fact, I'm like, well, yeah, my wife is beautiful and hot and all that stuff. It's, it's very true. But I, I, I authentically am not jealous or challenged by it. Why? Sure. Because I, because, the, because yeah, okay. there's, no, there's no doubt about her love for me, right? Yeah. And my love, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? 100%. Like, if I was a weaker man in a weaker relationship, you know, I'd be losing my mind. I know guys... Yes, we all know people. All, anyone who's listening to this can think of that guy or that woman who's just so jealous that it's absurd and that their jealousy ruins everything about that relationship. You know what I yes. mean? And ultimately that jealous person primarily is, is insecure in their, 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 anemic in their awareness of their of the love that the other person has for them but ultimately it's really about their love for that other person is weak mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what i'm saying and so this is the thing about truth right and so that kind of people people looking at truth as this kind of like utilitarian thing that's going to help me win battles and help me get to some place in life you see what i'm saying it's all to some degree still about you yes and and i think that's where a lot of this just ultimately comes comes from you know but in regards to historically like i'm sure someone can say well technically blah 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 which is I, that's totally fine you know um but i think the spirit of it and especially the where it's led us today um i think is pretty clear for me at least you know so there's like, it seems to be a correlation again, coming back to the cross, a correlation between like when a, a person becomes dead to things is oftentimes when they're seeking comfort. And like, so being comfortable 
it's much more comfortable for me, Father. I don't know about you, for my news to just go and right on up to my intellect and just like hang out there and just chill. And it's like, that's comfortable for me because then, I don't know, maybe I can avoid a hurt. Sometimes if someone says something hurtful to me, then I can rationalize it in my brain. So You're in greater control. control. Exactly, exactly. So well, then- Seemingly, seemingly greater mm -hmm. control. I have this illusion of control, perhaps. Correct. Like, Correct. so then, then there's the opposite end, which is go ahead and get that noose moving around and go ahead and bring it on down and kind of like maybe endure hanging out in here for a little while and kind of, you know, feeling that coming. Um, and then, but that's life giving because then suddenly I'm experiencing life. I'm not rationalizing things, things aren't coming to me on my terms. Well, well now let's just be clear. The reason why it's life-giving is because now you remove the means, you've removed the, the excuse me, you remove the things that were blocking you from the source of life. Yes. That that's that's the key. Because this is, I mean, uh, salvation is not about us it's about yeah. us it's about us and god right and the reason why i'm saying that is because it is so true that the greatest source of our problems is ourselves it's it's so true yeah um the devils they are very vicious they hate you with a the passion they're incredibly intelligent incredibly shrewd and powerful like let's let's just be frank but they can't do anything to you that you don't give them the fuel to do it with, right? And so when you begin to understand that, like, look, the saints are people who have been saved. And what we mean, what I mean by that is they've begun to restore that image of God to such a degree that the likeness they're now getting the likeness and they get the likeness of God to such a degree that they begin to enter into that, you know, pre-lapsarian state, that, that state of Adam before the fall. Mm -hmm. They're able to be at peace with the animals. They're able to be at peace with their fellow man, but even their enemy, they're even the, they are even able to be at peace within themselves. Right. And this is, this is heaven, this is paradise, this is what that means, right? You begin to experience paradise now within you and around you. It's, it's very real. Oh yeah. It's very real, you know? And the only reason I can say I know it's real is because I just know the opposite is real. Like I've tasted, I've tasted the peace, but I can tell how the hell that this unity brings. Yeah. That actual like hell. I was, um, talking with this person the other day the same conversation about hell and i don't know if i've ever told you this story father but i was baptized i've told you this part but not the rest of it i was baptized at a mission that was right down the street from my house i lived at at the time and i had been there once or twice and um i knew the priest i recognized him he eventually was the priest that baptized me um but there was some sunday and i was really hung over like just not doing well and I just went down to the gas station. Uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, drove us down to the gas station probably to get like a monster energy drink and some potato chips because I wasn't doing well. And I was wearing my pajamas and I was all hung over. My hair was all messed up and stuff and I just wasn't doing good. And she ran into the gas station to go get the stuff. And I was sitting in the car and it was a Sunday morning. And I saw him pull up to that gas station, which was right across the street from that mission. And I saw him, he was probably leaving town and he like walked in and I cowered. Like, I was like, he knew me, I knew him, but I was not doing well. I was like hung over. I was just trying to get some junk food to go back home and try and make myself feel normal, quote unquote. And instead, like I was shriveled away, like the cockroach, like you were talking about last week, I totally scattered. I like, I weren't even pulling up like my jacket over my head so he couldn't see me. Now, I think one of the reasons why, obviously, and I know I'm coming back to the same thing I keep coming back to is because the night before, 
I had indulged. I had overindulged. And I'm not even talking about Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a priest. It was a priest of the church. How much more infinitely so would it be like if I had died in that state? Mm -hmm. If I had died in that state and then went and met my creator, who I knew in my heart of hearts was doing what he was doing the entire time. So um, well, that was... Let's be clear about something, though. That was Christ. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, like, this this is the thing. Um, you know, I've been speaking with someone about this recently. You know, this person has been you know, wanting to understand some things. And I, I, Christ is absolutely tangible in the life of the church. And in fact, um, the priest, like, that, that response was because Christ, it, it was Christ. I mean, again, not metaphor, reality that, you know, it's not my priesthood, it's Christ's priesthood that he shares with me. You, you see what I'm saying? When you kiss, when you kiss the priest's hand, you're not kissing Father Jack's hand, Father, you know what I mean? <laughs> you're, 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 it's, it's Christ. And and that reality, and I do mean reality, you experienced it. Your rational mind was like, oh, there's Father, you know, James or whatever, like boom, boom, boom. But like, no, your soul understood, right? My soul knew what was up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like we talk about sometimes, uh, you know, when the baby's crying and stuff like that before the baptism, it's like, yeah, because their little souls see the grave. You know what I mean? Like Whoa. that's, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. So this is, this is really important to understand because all this points to the reality of salvation and salvation not being some sort of like metaphor, analogy, but literally, you know, we are being um, returned. We're being saved not only from death from the final death the mm. second death we're not only being saved from it we're being brought into life you know life in christ and and that life is very real right so okay so the a couple of weeks ago somebody i was talking to said that they were talking to someone blah 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 salvation and um they said to the person who was talking to me, I don't even know if I would consider Orthodox Christians saved. Um, they were a Protestant coming at it, kind of attacking Orthodoxy a little bit. And the person came to me and was like, what would you say back to that? And I said, I think I would agree. Yeah. As like, as I they- I was like, yeah, we did the same thing too. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's kind of that whole like, well, yeah, well, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. Saved comes with this surety. I don't know if I'm saved or not. So like when people speak to me about saved, I'm always like, I don't know. I mean, I really have no idea if that's what's going to happen with me. Like, and I have to be okay with that. I have to be you okay. Have to be. You have to be, you have to be. I mean, I can tell you now, on the one hand, I'm, I'm more sure than I've ever been and on the other hand, I'm, I'm more sure than I've ever been that there's you know, probably not be safe. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. like that. And, and that's so perplexing for people because, again, it, it's the, the answer and the way that we've been habituated and conditioned to think certain ways that are not conducive to spiritual life. That's really the problem, you know, um, because, again, it's this kind of transaction. It's like, well, look, I have paid. I said the magic words. <laughs> I did the dances, whatever pay up sucker but yeah. that's not that's not how this is you know what i mean like what man or woman if you approach your spouse like that is going to be married for long like it doesn't you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't work that way so i think the the problem primarily what we're talking about there is that it it really negates the great gift of man's free will because the new testament is full of accounts of people leaving the faith full of them full of really them. oh yeah okay oh yeah okay oh yeah okay yeah. and then that's not even that's not even counting um 
all the all the hagiographical uh, accounts from like the prologue and the synoxedion and the lines you know lines of the saints like so many accounts of think about the 40 martyrs of sebast right the, the man saw there's there the the 40 martyrs of sebast these these uh these soldiers who were faithful christians who were um ratted out and and the prefect finds out that they're christians and is like go we can't have this so <laughs> he takes them to the frozen lake and puts them out on the lake and they're slowly freezing to death and you know has a nice nice bath warm bathhouse waiting there on the on the shore That's right, right? That's right and uh, the one the one of the the martyrs he well he says i can't do this i can't do it and he leaves he says forgive me but he he leaves and gets into the bath and gets warm and doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to freeze to death. And so one of the soldiers who was appointed to watch the, the, the Mars of Sebast, he's looking, he sees these crowns in the sky. He sees 40 crowns, but he, he sees this other one apostatize and come back in. And he says, I still see 40 crowns. That, that, that crown, but there's only 39 men on the ice. That crown must be mine. And he goes out and he, and he dies with them. You know, so there's so many accounts of people um, apostatizing, but let's just be clear. I'll give you the greatest account of all, right? Judas. Hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. Judas was uh, chosen. Ju Jesus chose Judas. Jesus led Judas into the inner circle. In the hymnography for, I believe it's Holy Friday. The, the church, we pray, we sing, you know, what, uh, what miracle did I not work for you that I did? What miracle did I, did I work for the others I didn't work for you? You know, what word did I share with the others I did not share with you? Talking to Judas. Hmm. You know, it's like everything he did for John, he did for, for Judas. Yeah. Right? And Judas still betrayed him. So that's why, you know, it, it's kind of a weird thing. God help us and God help me. But I get some comfort from Judas because it's like, as a spiritual father, when I see someone just kind of like, ugh, like not doing good, it's just like, well, you know, just you pray for them, you hope the best for them, but it's just like, man, even the Lord himself had someone who turned away from him. It's like, it's, it's just, it's tough. And I, and I know that sounds kind of weird for someone to hear that from me, but like, you have to understand like. What's the angle that you find comfort on that from? Like as a spiritual father? As what what I mean by comfort is, um, there's a space in which there's a space in which despair and kind of like oh it's all my fault like that's not healthy, that yeah. that's my own weakness that that's my own that's the own temptation right. Yes. The reality is is that people are given freedom, and as a spiritual father, I I I do everything I can to maintain that freedom because that's what God's given them. You know, I'll, I'll pray for them. I'll spend as much time as I can. You know, I'll do everything I can for someone. But for, ultimately, for some people, they just choose to reject God. And it's, it's I, you know, I can't explain why. I just pray, God forbid, you know, if not for the grace of God, there go I. God yeah. forbid, I ever find myself in that place, right? Um, so it gives the, the fear, puts the fear of God in me. But what I'm trying to say is it makes me go like, yeah, well, I mean, even Jesus lost one. And I know that sounds kind of terrible for someone. Um, but what I mean by that is when you understand the humility of the Lord, you know, I don't even understand it, but I understand it enough to say it's beyond my human comprehension, how humble and how merciful the Lord is um he's so and that sounds again counterintuitive someone but he's so humble and merciful that he won't he won't force anyone even if that means their their damnation that's what's so crazy about it because people understand when we say their damnation that what we mean is them cutting themselves off and refusing the, the love of god yeah it's not god doing it it's them it's not god yeah it's them and i know people go like what How's that even a thing? I'm like, well, all I can tell you is that it's true. I've I've experienced it. I've ex I have ex I have experienced the strength of human will, 
the <laughs> strength of human freedom. It's a, it's the most powerful force, you know, um, the most powerful created force, right? Because nothing trumps the uncreated energies of God for sure. But like in regards to created forces, human freedom and will, it can bring people heaven and it can bring them hell. Man. Okay. All right. So then riddle me this, Batman. If like, if God is truly like, which he is, of course, like powerless before us, because like, we are who we are and we have, and he's given us the power that we have, right? Like, has he given us, like, the free will was given to us as a power? Anyways, that, that, that's a tangent. I gotta, I gotta not do that because I gotta work that out later in my own brain. Okay. But um, if uh, God is then, like, so God really just has done everything he possibly can. Like, there's, like, really nothing, like, his, God's not going to do a deus ex machina. He's not going to come in and suddenly like change the rules in this aspect. Okay. Like he's following the rules that are sought and that's, set up. It's one of the reasons why Protestantism, it's another aspect of Protestantism that no one ever talks about. Because it's this idea that God did that, that he's changing the rules or something because, you know, to meet us where we're at. I remember when I was converting and this guy, you know, he was a good friend of mine. It's kind of like one of my first Judas experiences, you know, but he ended up, you know, stabbing me in the back and doing all this stuff, whatever. But like, you know, he meant well, whatever. But I remember it was like one of my last days at the evangelical church that I, you know, kind of um, grew up in. Not grew up in as a boy, but it's like as, as, you know, becoming a Christian and then just kind of like learning sure. what that means, right? And I was just kind of like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm like wrestling with things and having these conversations with the elders and people in the church. And anyways, I remember like outside the church, I remember this, like, I can see it right now, just playing out the weather, what we're wearing, everything, you know? And um, he's, he was just basically like, no, man, like God, God will just meet, change and meet us where we're at, you know? And I was like, ah, you know, he was basically saying like, the Catholic way of understanding things, small c, right? Mm -hmm. um, the saints, the sacraments, he's like, nah, God's not doing that anymore. He's brought us a new way because that's what we needed. And like, you know, and I was another like, hey, revelation. Man. Yeah, I was like, ah, you know? Yeah. Um, because this is a hard thing. Like, I'm just gonna say it, you know? Um, we oftentimes do a disservice to people by acting like, it's the same religion. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I, I'll say, I mean, I hate to say it because I don't scan for people, but like, it's one of those things where, you know, I have one of those kind of like, okay, look, you know, you're a catechumen now, or like you're about to get baptized and say, I'll say, pull you aside and say, look, we need to have some of these conversations now, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, I knew there was something hidden, but like, yeah, I'll just tell everybody what one of those one of those conversations look like. It's like, look, the fact of the matter is, is that you are joining a different religion, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, in spite of that, God has called you, and God loves you, and God's been speaking to you, and all that good stuff. But like, you've really had a false god. You've had a false understanding of who God is, ultimately, and. In order for you to become orthodox, you have to renounce these things, like truly, or you'll never really be orthodox, right? You'll never really experience it. You'll, you'll just kind of like be giving membership to something. But I'm like, the only way to really experience all this, all this revelation, the only way it's possible is you have to realize that like, at the very least, and I mean the least, this is like a kind of like, a fulfilling of what you've had but i don't even like to say that to people sometimes because it gives them i wondered yeah it, it i gives wondered. them it gives them too much latitude to just kind of like pick and choose what they think what they're comfortable with you know what i mean and that that's just that's not the case like when you when you convert when you become orthodox you have to learn to take god as god has revealed himself to us not as you want him to be, not as grandma told you, 
not as your youth pastor who was great to you and got you through that real hard time. I mean, God bless them, but like, there's a reason why you darken the doorstep of the church, <laughs> right? So since that's the case, and since if we're if we are on the same page of saying that God brought you to the Orthodox Church, then what that means is you now need to understand that God is as how the church reveals him, right? So therefore, what that means is there are no more new revelations. There is no like that ecumenical councils, right? Like this is the faith that was revealed once and for all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and that's why even, even like for us, um, like when we talk about councils or anything even close to that, it's not about something new of who God is, is going to be revealed at all. It's about, well, how do we deal with these new ways in which issues are, are revealing themselves? It's never about a new way of God. Yes. In it's fact, always, oftentimes we're fighting that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I say and we. Like I'm and that's how, we, that's how we're saved. By, by also preserving the faith. Preserving the thing that will save us. Right? The thing that, this is the thing. Um, orthodoxy gives, gives all the means by which man can be saved. Which means, gives all the means by which man can be purified of the taint of his sin man can be purified of all the taint of the world man can be purified of all the taint of the influence of the demons and man can be purified and delivered from death once a man is purified and then delivered he's then ushered into illumination where he begins to understand not simply the mysteries of life but who god is and once he begins to understand who god is he then begins to taste of the life of god and that's deification right that's yeah. what salvation is, right? And so if, if you're not in the church, what you're getting is an ideology. If you're not in the church, forgive me, but to some degree, what you're getting is kind of like a very uh, vivifying to some degree, but a mythology still. If you're not in the church, right? You're getting a narrative, a story of Christ. And that's all good and dandy because we have the narrative and the story too, but we also have where that meets the objective right? Yes. The of reality. And that, and that's the thing that everyone's missing. Like reading a jet ski magazine versus actually riding on a jet ski. I mean, yes. You know? Thank you for condescending down to my, my, my language father. Hey. <laughs> <A> very, <laughs> it okay. was like, sure, man. Sure. Okay. Sure. Cool. Anytime. Um, so um, then I thought of this, Peter kind of apostatized then, right? Like, yeah, I was actually going to bring up Peter too. Um, I was going to bring him up as a, as the kind of like positive example of that, um, because in many ways that um, that process of of falling away is something we all experience too. Mm -hmm. But every time we do, we have this potential of being like Peter who will repent and, and weep bitterly, or will be like Judas who also wept bitterly, but his repentance lacked love. Yes. His repentance was, was, was rooted in guilt, right? And not so much- Which is kind of pride then. Yes, it's, it's egoism still. You know, I, I have this long running joke with my wife where a lot of times I'll say something and I'll be like, I don't know what sin it is. And it's like, well, she's like, well, it's pride. I'm like, OK, well, you know, that's kind of like the answer to all of it. So it's not really fair for you to be like, well, it's pride because it's like it's I can't think of another example right off the top of my head. But it's like um, it's the answer to everything. So if your answer is always correct, then you don't like it's not like a good thing that you use that one answer over and over again to the correct. I mean, it is correct, but it's like, it's not exact always. It's not it's exact always. Right. And so, yes, it's always pride in a general sense, but oftentimes you need to be more exacting in certain things before you can actually, in a, in a kind of paradoxical sense, you need to actually sometimes go around it before you can get to the, get to it directly. If that makes sense. Like if you hit it too head on, 
um, it's it's kind of like imagine this slippery, gross like blob of cancer that <laughs> like if you try to just kind of like grab it at, at one aspect, just keep slipping on your fingers. You have to like kind of come to the side and get to the sure. root. Or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you get that analogy. It's like, this is why you have to kind of, um, in regards of salvation, you have to oftentimes go through what some, most people consider to be a kind, of, kind of circuitous route, going all the way around things, which I know that's one of the, that's one of the things that can be problematic in regards of, you know, me or or a priest is that people would be like well just get direct to it but you know what i found i'm pretty direct with people when it comes to these issues but a lot of people just can't handle it yes they just yeah. can't handle it you know what i mean so um, you, you just you have to find other ways to to kind of get to it to help them in the long run you know so it's like yeah i'd love to get to your pride but you can't handle it and what's the point of like getting to that cancer if it's gonna, the, the surgeon isn't gonna, you know, lose the patient on the table at the cost of being like, aha, I got the tumor, but I killed the patient. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's great, you got the tumor, but he's dead. So it's the same thing. You know, it's like most people, pride is like that tumor that's just so close to a main artery. It's, it's just tough to get at it. And you gotta kind of tackle some other things first. and. I mean, because even Christ is like, oh, buddy, you got sins you're not even aware of yet. Oh, yeah. Like, I know what they are. And I'm like, not going to tell you because yeah. like, you know, Well, the Lord, I mean, the Lord did say like, there's things I would, I would tell you, but you know, you can't handle it now. Yeah. You know? Um, and if we understand, someone could say, like, well, he's talking about things of heavenly nature. I'm like, yeah, but doesn't that also include things about ourselves and our, in our nature? In I would think people? so. Yeah, you, if you're gonna, you can't be, you can't get to illumination without purification. You can't get to the resurrection without the cross. You know, like that's just the reality. Hmm. So then, of course, the salvation, salvation really just comes down to the cross. Like having to like embrace the cross and be like, hey, if it's good enough for him, it's probably good enough for me yeah i mean yeah i i think i think the thing to kind of bring into focus here though is repentance and how the cross facilitates repentance oh boy does it yeah it's like you can never like people who don't repent are people who don't embrace their cross you know it's like you don't you can't you can't engage repentance in any meaningful way without without the death of the cross like you just it's impo it's impossible right um and so people's unwillingness to do violence to themselves um it costs them an even greater an, an even greater sum if i could say it that way because look on a real practical level, when you when you learn to humble yourself before others, guess what happens? Your your relationships not only go smoother, but they they actually produce fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're constantly just if you're always right and everything's always about you, and you're always the victim, it's like you end up in a place where just people people's love for you is is can slowly turn into just toleration which i mean that's a sad tragic thing to say but it's just yes. true like unless you're surrounded by people who have the love of god in them and are and and are striving for the love of god if you're one of those people who's like you're always right everyone's always wrong you're a victim if you're one of those people and you don't, and, and, and the ones that are in your life are not people who are love Christ and, and are striving to, to be, to grow with him. That's essentially what every relationship you you're going to have is going to be like. It's people just tolerating you or people who will basically say, well, the fallout from getting away from this person may not be worth, <laughs> may yeah. not be worth like 
wow. putting up with it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And like that's hell, that's hell in itself, too. Yeah. But that's real. That's real. Yeah. I'm not sure what to say about that. Because I'm worried I'm that guy. I don't think I am. I don't think I am. Oh, well, you're not that guy. You're not that guy. Oh. Thank yeah, you. you keep bringing me comic books. You're not that guy. <laughs> I, do. I do bring father comic books. Yeah. Um, so um boy it's hard making up for cyprian because he's usually got all the really really good questions i'm kind of just the silly guy so i'm i'm going to try and go on um but just so everybody knows i am sweating here a little bit but that's okay i'm just trying to keep up so um the last thing i wanted to touch on because i found it so interesting was on on the incarnation uh of course saint athanasius athanasius athanasius, saint athanasius the great athanasius against the world yep. yes i this was one of a saint that very early on i really started to reach out to during the beginnings or when i kind of woke up last year in 2020 mm -hmm. he was a guy i prayed to quite a bit um mm -hmm. he was a saint that i was like trying to really look up to and emulate as best as i could um <laughs> just the whole i don't care I don't care what you're saying. Like, it's just like, it's not right. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but he talked about the manner of which Christ needed. So he goes through this whole part where he talks about like how it had to be public. It, he, the, the death had to be public. The crucifixion had to be public. He couldn't die. So then people ask, okay, well, why did he die crucified? Like of crucifixion, why not die of sickness? like alone with like his disciples and then die and then come back and i was wondering really quick since we had touched on the other part why the crucifixion needed to be the way that it did is that something you're comfortable in answering like why could it not have been at home alone in bed you know like why did it have to be so public why did it have to be a crucifixion why did it have to be the way that it was because we talked on the nature of the, of the cross and everything like that but we did uh, yeah didn't we i thought we did mm. yeah, that was like the whole first hour we'll go back and we'll listen to it later father but yeah, like I mean, I mean there's a couple of things there i'm not gonna i mean this is right this is this is the stuff that giants have been made on made of you know it's like this is the deep stuff of, of i mean i I'm not, even, I'm not even gonna say far deeper and and like spiritual men than I like. I'm not even I, I'm not even gonna say that. That's how far like they are. I am from them. It's just like sure. right. So but I will say that um when you begin to understand that the cross exists and the power of the cross exists even prior to the crucifixion, when you begin to understand that it's in the mind of God from the beginning of time, you begin to understand that it's um, even the very nature and makeup of it, right? Across is four points, north, mm -hmm. south, east, west, right? Up and down, right? <laughs> um, when you begin to understand that a cross represents this, the kind of totality of, of, of the cosmos and creation, you begin to understand that the cross is the kind of like essence of what it means to be man. It's, it's, it's the poles of man, his head, right? His feet and his arms, right? The, the thing that binds him to heaven and to earth and moves him in space, right? When you begin to understand the cross represents the, the vulnerability of man laid out and also the vulnerability of man exposed for the sake of love, because how do you embrace one? Like all of these very rich symbolic aspects I've just brought up are very real. Yes. And so when you begin to understand that, then why the cross begins to, you begin to see it because the, it's not, it's not a matter of, we need to find ways to find, it's not a matter of finding meaning in the cross. It's that it's already there. We have to uncover it. It's already within us. Yes. It, yes. It's already within us, right? We, we, we uncover it. So I think that answers it. We have to really be grafted to the tree, don't we? We really have to be grafted. I was thinking about this earlier today about like the nature of like what happens when someone goes heretical. Mm -hmm. When someone from the church 
like so we lost the members uh when they leave we just keep going mm -hmm. like we keep going the tree remains the same the tree the cross if you will like remains the same so like when someone is grafted like they have to graft and the graft has to take and in order for the take to be there it has to be connected on if not all then every level it possibly can be connected like i'll never get the fullness mm -hmm. but gosh darn it i'm going to keep trying and i'm going to like even if it's only get a quarter of what i can possibly get in this life then i'm going to get it in, in order for that graph to take and like the church i mean the tree going to remain the same no matter what the tree is going to be fine like the tree is going to just keep going doing its tree thing hanging out and then the saplings or what or whatever the things want to like fall off and go try and do their own thing and wither away and die away from it that's fine the tree's not going to stop them like that's it's just going to keep on going and you know not for one for one because i mean obviously the tree's going to be praying that they come back but i was just thinking like i really have to come into this from the perception of like I have to change in order for to become more like this thing I'm entering into. I can't find this thing and expect it to meet me where I am. You know what I mean? Like, it's not going to alter itself to change to me. Like, I can't come in and be like, well, I really think it'd be a good idea if we did this part of the liturgy differently. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think we should like move this thing around. I have to accept that the liturgy is the way the liturgy is. You, you, you're being grafted into the tree, not the other way around. That, that's what I meant to, that's what I, that's the analogy. I was, if I misspoke, I'm sorry. Yes. I got to be grafted onto that dang old tree. I have to be done. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you're right. You're fine. I'm just, I'm just reemphasizing that, you know, to kind of bring what you're saying. Okay. okay gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just want to say this thing, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe this is kind of like, I don't know where this is at, but I think this is important to understand. You know, I was explaining this to the kids on Friday. Um, and I think this plays into this question too about, you know, who for us and for our salvation. Let's just be clear about the word heretic. Let's be clear about something. Yeah, that's a good idea. A heretic isn't someone who's mistaken. That's not you we're all mistaken on certain things let's say right and in regards to theology and dogmas of the church it's like someone can be mistaken and that's fine the problem is if they've been warned <laughs> exhort really if they've been yeah. warned, if they've been exhorted if they've been rebuked and they still persist in it then they're a heretic then they're a heretic so this is really important because no one wakes up and is like, I didn't know I was a heretic. It doesn't work that way. A lot of people, that term will be used improperly. And you understand a heretic is someone who's been warned and has refused that. And right? heretic means things differently, right? Yeah. Who's, yes, but the better way to understand it is about they, they hold and, and uplift their opinion above the truth. Right? That's, that's sure. what a heretic does. So the reason why this is pertinent, I think, to like for us men of our salvation is that it demonstrates how this freedom, how this reality of freedom and the participation in the life of Christ is salvation, right? So in other words, in the same way that when we freely assent and receive the dogmas and the life of the church, we find life and we're saved because within the church, Everything is given for the correction of man, his repentance, and his salvation. There's nothing lacking, right? If you're sick, the church will heal you. It won't necessarily happen overnight. It might, but it generally won't. But you'll be healed, right? But you can reject that, and people do. Yes. People would be like, no, I don't, I don't want to adhere to this. The church is teaching this on sexuality. I don't want to, I don't believe that. I don't want to hear that. Okay. Coolio. Well, what? Coolio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. But it's, it's going to cost you. Right. And it'll cost you in a way more than just, you know, oh, you're not part of our club because you don't, you don't think like we do. No, no, no. Your, your appetites and your refusal to address them are killing you and will kill you. The, the, they will bring disease to your body, potentially, 
they will rob you of your your vitality in your body for sure but they'll definitely kill your soul absolutely yes right? so just to give an example when you when you are in heresy right heresy leads to death right because you you begin the process of severing yourself from the tree yes. of the life from christ so amen hmm Mm. Mm. all right um oh yeah sorry this is the problem with this podcast especially with just two people i will say this because i'm learning just as much as everybody else probably like and so i sit here and i'm like processing the information and usually this is the part where i see cyprian's shoulder go up because his shoulder goes up whenever he's getting ready to say something. Yeah. So when I see his shoulder go up, I'm like, all right, cool. I can zone out for a little bit and like process what Father Turbo is saying. So that's the problem. That's why we need the third. That's why we need the third, but it's okay. So Father, if you were to be stuck listening to, say we're all gulagged and they find out what album would, they would play for you over and over and over again that would actually constitute torture what album would that be because i have my answer right away and i'll vamp is uh cory taylor from slipknot has like a country music album oh, and it's cmft and it's cory mother uh -huh. trailer and i want to keep the podcast pg so i'm not going to say the f word but I think literally that or like was that that hinder song, the lips of an angel, that song that came out like the mid aughts or something like that. Yeah. But they have like a whole it's butt rock. It's like because you wouldn't even get me with like a Nickelback because Nickelback has a nuts like enough like pop sensibility. Yeah. Um, that I can still kind of get on board with some of it. Like they're kind of. Um, you know what? This is going to be weird. I don't, I don't know how to say this, but I think I want to say like the Grateful Dead, man. Oh, no. Yeah, and, 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 and I say that because people be like, what? And then knowing my wife, right? Yes. And so everyone should know, let no one ever doubt my absolute devotion, adoration, and love for my wife because man. I just ah oh gosh i cannot stand the grateful dead man and yeah and so even like their more streamlined stuff not they game. have one they have one song that i can handle right like uh was it fade to gray or whatever i'm, I'm not sure I don't it's know. like the one song that was on mtv or whatever like when i was a kid but other than that i just cannot i can't deal with grateful dead i just can't do it um, i'm sure there's other things that are worse i'm sure, sure but it's what i it's what kind of came to mind and 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 i think it's yeah i mean let no one ever challenge my love for my wife you know because i just oh, I, I loathe the grateful dead but man their their art is so good that's, that's another reason why I can't stand them because it's like you look at the Grateful Dead like, man, this is going to be some heavy good stuff. Great name. Yeah, I know. I think his name was Jack Irons, the guy who did the art. It's like great art. And then like, yeah. you put it on, you're like, what? And you know what it's like? It's like... The end of Crazy Train, how it starts with that amazing... No, 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 no. It's like biting into a donut and there's a bunch of fish guts in it. Oh, that's that's wow. what I'd be like they need to put that on their next like album is like yeah. it's like biting into a donut yeah. finding a bunch of fish guts yeah. father turbo um yeah i mean i never even really listened to him that much i know when we were moving to kansas city oh my gosh when we were moving to kansas city we were at the u-haul place and the guy that was serving us was like just the typical like 100 like grateful dead fan like without a doubt just like he was older he was just like jamming away like kind of just hanging out and we happened to be like renting on like the day it was like jerry garcia's like birthday or something like that and i asked the date he's like 
blah 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 jerry garcia's birthday and i was just like how did i know you're a great grateful dead fan like i just knew from the like there's a part of my soul that just recognized your deadheadness like right away i actually don't mind them too much i think they're fine it's not really my jam but no pun intended but like it's not really my jam to like sit there and just listen to grateful dead albums then the last question I have, and it's a quick one, is do you like Pepsi or Coke better? Oh, Coke for sure. Pepsi's, really? Yeah, Pepsi's too sweet. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Wine taste test, man. Yeah. Coke I actually really don't like Pepsi's, either one Pepsi's of them. Too sweet. Pepsi's too sweet. Dark Cola it makes my mouth feel weird. Uh-huh. Uh, but, um, Yeah. Dr. I'm a Dr. Pepper man. Sorry, Vin or man, Vin, Vince. Okay, so next week, or no, not next week, but what we talked about um, was that we would like to maybe do a Q&A episode, a question and answer episode. So that uh, email landing page, if you guys want to start sending in some questions or even just leaving them in the YouTube comments or stuff like that, um, I, I thought that we could maybe do like um, a whole episode of just like some questions and answers, or maybe that's a good way to end the show or something like that is with somebody asking a question. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, but uh, if you guys want to start sending in, I don't know who's checking the email or anything like that, but yeah, go ahead and start sending stuff in or leaving um, questions and stuff like that in the comments. But anyway, thank you for sticking with us. I, it was a crazy one. We lost Vin. He's okay, though. He's all right. Or we lost Cyprian. He's okay. Um, he actually just texted us. It seems like he'd actually be able to rejoin the conversation, like, right now. But I'm but, tired. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired, too, man. It's been a day. We're week three into a fast. So, yeah, we got stuff to do. But thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week.